My special guest today is Professor Peter Ebling, who is uh, Head of the Department of Medicine here at Monash Health. Thank you for your time, Peter. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, you've been doing some CPD presentations for us on osteoporosis. Um, what are the, the, the hot topics, the controversies in the treatment of osteoporosis at the moment? What I really think GPs need to know is that a lot of people with fragility or minimal trauma fractures aren't actually being treated. Right. So less than 20% of people who come into a hospital go to an emergency department or see their local doctor with a fracture are actually being investigated or treated for osteoporosis. And this is one of the largest evidence treatment gaps we have in medicine at the moment. Is that because of the the debate that's been going on about um, bisphosphonates and no, I don't think that's the reason. I okay. think it's just um, a lack of communication, really. Yeah. People see the patient with a the fracture, they want to fix it, and that's the right thing to do at the time. But then the communication between that doctor and the one who might want to investigate them or treat them for osteoporosis isn't made. The link isn't made that this fracture is really due to osteoporosis. Right. So if nothing's done about, say, a fractured wrist at the age of 45, that woman will go on to have a spinal fracture at the age of 60 and then die of a hip fracture at the age of 75 or 80. Right. So that's why we have to break this fracture cascade and start investigation and treatment early. So that's the message GPs need, is, is to always think of osteoporosis when they have yeah. a patient? if they see a patient with a collie's fracture or with a spinal fracture or fractured humerus, then think, well, is osteoporosis present? Because we want to prevent the hip fractures later on. And what is the frontline treatment these days? Well, there are lots of things we can do to try and prevent osteoporosis. I mm -hmm. think that's really important. You know, prevention is better than treatment. Yep. So throughout life, I think we urge a good vitamin D level, an optimal calcium intake through dietary means, yep. and then weight-bearing exercise as well. This is particularly at, in childhood, around the time of puberty, that's the best time for exercise to have an effect on the growing skeleton. Right. So that's really early prevention, isn't it, in, yep. in childhood, and I think... We're seeing kids at computers now and we have to get them up and active playing soccer or something like that to get them moving around that time. So I think that's really important. But this sort of thing, the weight-bearing exercise, calcium and vitamin D, helps throughout life. It's never too late, particularly in the elderly. Mm. But then if we think about um, the time to be assessed for osteoporosis, in a woman it's probably around the time of the menopause. Yep. That would be a good time to have a bone health check and in older men after the age of 60. Now, we do have effective treatments. You know, when I started doing research in osteoporosis, it was about 25 or more years ago. Yeah. We didn't have any treatments then. Now we've got about six or seven effective treatments. And I think we can tailor the treatment so that it suits the patient. You know, it could be a weekly tablet or a monthly tablet or an right. intravenous infusion once a year or a subcutaneous injection every six months. But we have the treatments available and usually patients will accept one of those treatments and they are effective at reducing fractures. So the overall uh, reduction in fractures is about 50% with these treatments. Is there a need to take, for example, a drug holiday from those treatments at any point? Yeah, that's been a controversial area, whether or not drug holidays, I don't like the term holidays, Yeah, because holidays can lapse into retirement. <laughs> so I think what we need to think about is if you are going to stop treatment after, say, five to seven years on an oral bisphosphonate, yep. then don't forget about the patient. Yes. The patient has to come back in, say, another two years following a repeat bone density test to make sure there hasn't been any bone loss. Yep. So it's not retirement. It's just a, a break in therapy so that we can monitor the bone density. So the patient does have to come back, and I think that's a really important thing. Now, are I think the reason for limiting the duration of bisphosphonate therapy has been uh, these long-term associations of bisphosphonate therapy. Now, these are really incredibly uncommon. Yeah. So the risk of having, say, osteonecrosis of the jaw or something, the risk of that is actually less than walking out of the doctor's surgery and getting hit by a car yeah. in, in, if we're treating patients for osteoporosis. And I think the message between cancer patients and patients with osteoporosis and bisphosphonate treatment has been mixed up there, so particularly right. with dentists, and they're driving this fear in patients of osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is unrealistic. Now, I think the other thing are the atypical femur fractures, yeah. and they are associated with the duration of bisphosphonate therapy. After about uh, eight years of therapy, it's about 113 per 100,000, so you know, it's about a one in a thousand risk or something like that. Yeah. So I think uh, that's 
why we're tending to think about limiting uh, exposure to bisphosphonates to say five or seven years with an oral bisphosphonate. But we want to make sure that patient's bone density gets above the osteoporosis range to stop the treatment because if they're still osteoporotic, the yeah. benefits of the treatment far outweigh the risks. Right. So I don't think we should be too concerned about these rare associations of treatment. The main thing is for people to start treatment with osteoporosis because that's not happening now. Yeah. What do you think the rate of under-treatment is? Can you, can you put a number on how many people are wandering around with osteoporosis without knowing it? Well, I think probably the under-treatment rate is about 50% or more. Wow. You know, based on the patients who already have fractures, it's about 80%. Yeah. So, you know, I think otherwise, if people just go along and have a bone density check and have osteoporosis, a lot of them aren't being on treatment as well. It does depend on the patient's age and other clinical risk factors, whether we treat them as well. Mm -hmm. But the most, most powerful risk factor is having that previous... Uh, minimal trauma or osteoporotic fracture. Right. What do GPs need to do to, to up their game, as it were, in, in this field? Do they, is there a, a screening test they need to put on their regular uh, yeah. you know, treatment rosters for, for patients of this age? I or think this GPs history? just need to think about their older patients' bone health, yeah. particularly women around the time of the menopause and men above the age of 60. You know, do they drink too much alcohol? Do they smoke? Do they have a family history of a hip fracture, mm -hmm. and most importantly, have they had a prior minimal trauma fracture? Right. Now, the people with a prior minimal trauma fracture, they need to be treated um, immediately. Yep. But those with risk factors, we can do a bone density test to see if they, in fact, do have osteoporosis. Okay. So in many cases, if they have some of those risk factors, that test will be reimbursed. But in other cases, unfortunately, it won't be reimbursed. Right. And the cost would vary between, you know, 100 and $250 to the patient. So does the PBS or the um, government need to get involved in subsidising these tests a bit more? Or? Well, we've got um, something before the government about sub, um, subsidising the test at right. the time of menopause if, say, women have two additional risk factors for osteoporosis. We, You know, Osteoporosis Australia has done that, but at the moment there hasn't been much interest in getting reimbursement, unfortunately. The government is tending to cut back rather than... Uh, hand out. Hand out, yes. <laughs> yes. What about the research in the field? Where, where is it heading? What are, the, what are the hot topics in terms of the future for mm. the... Well, the, the research is active, and it's been active in this area for a long time, mm. and it continues to strengthen. And I think this is going to create excellent outcomes for patients in the near future. I think what we're seeing is a focus on drugs that actually stimulate new bone formation, right. whereas the current drugs mainly inhibit the breakdown of old bone. So that's quite different yeah. to think you can actually form new bone. It's, wow. it's very exciting. So the only drug we have available at the moment is parathyroid hormone. Uh, that's fairly expensive. Mm -hmm. But we're uh, tri uh, trialling a new drug, which is an antibody against an inhibitor of bone formation. This is given as a monthly injection, and the results of that study will be coming out next year. So we're all very excited about that. Terrific. And I think that's what we're going to see, this evolution of using drugs that actually can more powerfully stimulate bone formation, and that means greater increases in, in bone density and bone strength, more importantly. So it's, it's really good, uh, good news, I think. Yes. Is there a genetic factor in osteoporosis? At there all? is. Yeah. So we're very interested in the genetics of osteoporosis, as have other people said, the Garvin Institute over the years. Mm. So um, I think we can't say that there are any specific genes that are involved in osteoporosis. There have been a few candidate genes, such as the vitamin D receptor, right. the est estrogen receptor, and the collagen 1 genes, but they only contribute a small amount to the risk of getting osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. So I think m probably many genes are involved. But I think we want to empower GPs. They're really the people that should be mon managing osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. It is a very common disease. Yeah. In our latest burden of illness report from Osteoporosis Australia, we estimated in 2012 there are about 1.2 million Australians with osteoporosis. So that's why it's not a specialist condition. Right. It's really a GP condition because it is so common. And the other thing apart from medical treatment is falls reduction in the elderly. Yeah. So uh, people often fracture when they fall. So the other key is as well as strengthening the bones is to reduce the risk of falling in older individuals. So it's a two-pronged approach. Yeah. And I think that's where GPs can really make an impact by assessing falls risk as well as bone health in their older patients. Okay. Thank you so much for your time today. It's a pleasure.